History and Nature Martin Luther King Jr., born Michael King Jr., January 15, 1929 to April 4, 1968, was an American Baptist minister and activist who was one of the most prominent leaders in the American civil rights movement from 1955 until his assassination on April 4, 1968. A black church leader and a son of early civil rights activist and minister Martin Luther King Sr., King advanced civil rights for people of color in the United States through nonviolence and civil disobedience. Inspired by his Christian beliefs and the nonviolent activism of Mahatma Gandhi, he led targeted, nonviolent resistance against Jim Crow laws and other forms of discrimination in the United States. King participated in and led marches for the right to vote, desegregation, labor rights, and other civil rights. He oversaw the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott and later became the first president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. As president of the SCLC, he led the unsuccessful Albany Movement in Albany, Georgia, and helped organize some of the nonviolent 1963 protests in Birmingham, Alabama. King was one of the leaders of the 1963 March on Washington, where he delivered his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. The Civil Rights Movement achieved pivotal legislative gains in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. The SCLC put into practice the tactics of nonviolent protest with some success by strategically choosing the methods and places in which protests were carried out. There were several dramatic standoffs with segregationist authorities, who frequently responded violently. King was jailed several times. Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, Director J. Edgar Hoover considered King a radical and made him an object of the FBI's COINTELPRO from 1963 forward. FBI agents investigated him for possible communist ties, spied on his personal life, and secretly recorded him. In 1964, the FBI mailed King a threatening anonymous letter, which he interpreted as an attempt to make him commit suicide. On October 14, 1964, King won the Nobel Peace Prize for combating racial inequality through nonviolent resistance. In 1965, he helped organize two of the three Selma to Montgomery marches. In his final years, he expanded his focus to include opposition towards poverty, capitalism, and the Vietnam War. In 1968, King was planning a national occupation of Washington, D.C., to be called the Poor People's Campaign, when he was assassinated on April 4 in Memphis, Tennessee. His death was followed by national mourning, as well as anger leading to riots in many U.S. cities. King was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1977 and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2003. Martin Luther King, Jr. Day was established as a holiday in cities and states throughout the United States beginning in 1971, the federal holiday was first observed in 1986. Hundreds of streets in the U.S. have been renamed in his honor, and King County in Washington was rededicated for him. The Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., was dedicated in 2011. Early Life and Education Birth King was born Michael King Jr. on January 15, 1929, in Atlanta, Georgia, the second of three children to Michael King and Alberta King, nay Williams. King had an older sister, Christine King Ferris, and a younger brother, Alfred Daniel A.D. King. Alberta's father, Adam Daniel Williams, was a minister in rural Georgia, moved to Atlanta in 1893, and became pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in the following year. Williams married Jenny Celeste Parks. King, Sr. was born to sharecroppers, James Albert and Delia King of Stockbridge, Georgia, and was of African-Irish descent. In his adolescent years, King Sr. left his parents' farm and walked to Atlanta where he attained a high school education and enrolled in Morehouse College to study for entry to the ministry. King Sr. and Alberta began dating in 1920 and married on November 25, 1926. Until Jenny's death in 1941, they lived together on the second floor of Alberta's parents' two-story Victorian house, where King was born. 
shortly after marrying Alberta, King Sr. became assistant pastor of the Ebenezer Church. Senior Pastor Williams died in the spring of 1931 and that fall, King Sr. took the role, where he would in time raise the attendance from 600 to several thousand. In 1934, the church sent King Sr. on a multinational trip, including to Berlin for the meeting of the Congress of the Baptist World Alliance, BWA. He also visited sites in Germany associated with the Reformation leader, Martin Luther. While there, King Sr. and the BWA delegates witnessed the rise of Nazism. In reaction, the BWA issued a resolution stating, this Congress deplores and condemns as a violation of the law of God the Heavenly Father, all racial animosity, and every form of oppression or unfair discrimination toward the Jews, toward colored people, or toward subject races in any part of the world. On returning home in August 1934, King Sr. changed his name to Martin Luther King and his five-year-old son's name to Martin Luther King Jr. Early Childhood At his childhood home, King and his two siblings would read aloud the Bible as instructed by their father. After dinners there, King's grandmother Jenny, whom he affectionately referred to as Mama, would tell lively stories from the Bible to her grandchildren. King's father would regularly use whippings to discipline his children. At times, King Sr. would also have his children whip each other. King's father later remarked, King was the most peculiar child whenever you whipped him. He'd stand there, and the tears would run down, and he'd never cry. Once when King witnessed his brother A.D. emotionally upset his sister Christine, he took a telephone and knocked out A.D. with it. When he and his brother were playing at their home, A.D. slid from a banister and hit into their grandmother, Jenny causing her to fall unresponsive. King, believing her dead, blamed himself and attempted suicide by jumping from a second-story window. Upon hearing that his grandmother was alive, King rose and left the ground where he had fallen. King became friends with a white boy whose father owned a business across the street from his family's home. In September 1935, when the boys were about six years old, they started school. King had to attend a school for black children, Young Street Elementary School, while his close playmate went to a separate school for white children only. Soon afterwards, the parents of the white boy stopped allowing King to play with their son, stating to him we are white and you are colored. When King relayed the happenings to his parents, they had a long discussion with him about the history of slavery and racism in America. Upon learning of the hatred, violence, and oppression that black people had faced in the U.S., King would later state that he was determined to hate every white person. His parents instructed him that it was his Christian duty to love everyone. King witnessed his father stand up against segregation and various forms of discrimination. Once, when stopped by a police officer who referred to King Sr. as boy, King's father responded sharply that King was a boy but he was a man. When King's father took him into a shoe store in downtown Atlanta, the clerk told them they needed to sit in the back. King's father refused, stating we'll either buy shoes sitting here or we won't buy any shoes at all, before taking King and leaving the store. He told King afterward, I don't care how long I have to live with this system, I will never accept it. In 1936, King's father led hundreds of African Americans in a civil rights march to the city hall in Atlanta to protest voting rights discrimination. King later remarked that King Sr. was a real father to him. King memorized and sang hymns and stated verses from the Bible by the time he was five years old. Over the next year, he began to go to church events with his mother and sing hymns while she played piano. His favorite hymn to sing was I Want to Be More and More Like Jesus, he moved attendees with his singing. King later became a member of the junior choir in his church. King enjoyed opera and played the piano. As he grew up, King garnered a large vocabulary from reading dictionaries and consistently used his expanding lexicon. He got into physical altercations with boys in his neighborhood, but oftentimes used his knowledge of words to stymie fights. King showed a lack of interest in grammar and spelling, a trait that he carried throughout his life. In 1939, King sang as a member of his church choir in slave costume, for the all-white audience at the Atlanta premiere of the film Gone with the Wind. 
In September 1940, at the age of 11, King was enrolled at the Atlanta University Laboratory School for the seventh grade. While there, King took violin and piano lessons and showed keen interest in his history and English classes. On May 18, 1941, when King had sneaked away from studying at home to watch a parade, King was informed that something had happened to his maternal grandmother upon returning home, he found out that she had suffered a heart attack and died while being transported to a hospital. He took the death very hard and believed that his deception of going to see the parade may have been responsible for God taking her. King jumped out of a second-story window at his home, but again survived an attempt to kill himself. His father instructed him in his bedroom that King should not blame himself for her death and that she had been called home to God as part of God's plan that could not be changed. King struggled with this and could not fully believe that his parents knew where his grandmother had gone. Shortly thereafter, King's father decided to move the family to a two-story brick home on a hill that overlooked downtown Atlanta. Adolescence In his adolescent years, he initially felt resentment against whites due to the racial humiliation that he, his family, and his neighbors often had to endure in the segregated South. In 1942, when King was 13 years old, he became the youngest assistant manager of a newspaper delivery station for the Atlanta Journal. That year, King skipped the ninth grade and was enrolled in Booker T. Washington High School, where he maintained a B average. The high school was the only one in the city for African American students. It had been formed after local black leaders, including King's grandfather, Williams, urged the city government of Atlanta to create it. While King was brought up in a Baptist home, King grew skeptical of some of Christianity's claims as he entered adolescence. He began to question the literalist teachings preached at his father's church. At the age of 13, he denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus during Sunday school. King said that he found himself unable to identify with the emotional displays and gestures from congregants frequent at his church, and doubted if he would ever attain personal satisfaction from religion. He later stated of this point in his life, doubts began to spring forth unrelentingly. In high school, King became known for his public speaking ability, with a voice that had grown into an orotund baritone. He proceeded to join the school's debate team. King continued to be most drawn to history and English, and chose English and sociology to be his main subjects while at the school. King maintained an abundant vocabulary. But, he relied on his sister, Christine, to help him with his spelling, while King assisted her with math. They studied in this manner routinely until Christine's graduation from high school. King also developed an interest in fashion, commonly adorning himself in well-polished patent leather shoes and tweed suits, which gained him the nickname Tweed or Tweedy among his friends. He further grew a liking for flirting with girls and dancing. His brother A. D. later remarked, he kept flitting from chick to chick and I decided I couldn't keep up with him. Especially since he was crazy about dances and just about the best jitterbug in town. On April 13, 1944, in his junior year, King gave his first public speech during an oratorical contest, sponsored by the Improved Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks of the World in Dublin, Georgia. In his speech he stated, Black America still wears chains. The finest Negro is at the mercy of the meanest white man. Even winners of our highest honors face the class color bar. King was selected as the winner of the contest. On the ride home to Atlanta by bus, he and his teacher were ordered by the driver to stand so that white passengers could sit down. The driver of the bus called King a black son of a bitch. King initially refused but complied after his teacher told him that he would be breaking the law if he did not follow the directions of the driver. As all the seats were occupied, he and his teacher were forced to stand on the rest of the drive back to Atlanta. Later King wrote of the incident, saying that night will never leave my memory. It was the angriest I have ever been in my life. Morehouse College During King's junior year in high school, Morehouse College, an all-male historically black college that King's father and maternal grandfather had attended, began accepting high school juniors who passed the school's entrance examination. As World War II was underway many black college students had been enlisted in the war, 
decreasing the numbers of students at Morehouse College. So, the university aimed to increase their student numbers by allowing juniors to apply. In 1944, at the age of 15, King passed the entrance examination and was enrolled at the university for the school season that autumn. In the summer before King started his freshman year at Morehouse, he boarded a train with his friend Emmett Weasel Proctor and a group of other Morehouse College students to work in Simsbury, Connecticut, at the tobacco farm of Coleman Brothers Tobacco, a cigar business. This was King's first trip outside of the segregated South into the integrated North. In a June 1944 letter to his father King wrote about the differences that struck him between the two parts of the country, on our way here we saw some things I had never anticipated to see. After we passed Washington there was no discrimination at all. The white people here are very nice. We go to any place we want to and sit anywhere we want to. The students worked at the farm to be able to provide for their educational costs at Morehouse College as the farm had partnered with the college to allot their salaries towards the university's tuition, housing, and other fees. On weekdays King and the other students worked in the fields, picking tobacco from 7 a.m. till at least 5 p.m., enduring temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, to earn roughly 4 U.S. dollars per day. On Friday evenings, King and the other students visited downtown Simsbury to get milkshakes and watch movies and on Saturdays they would travel to Hartford, Connecticut, to see theater performances, shop and eat in restaurants. On each Sunday they would go to Hartford to attend church services, at a church filled with white congregants. King wrote to his parents about the lack of segregation in Connecticut, relaying how he was amazed they could go to one of the finest restaurants in Hartford and that Negroes and whites go to the same church. He played freshman football there. The summer before his last year at Morehouse, in 1947, the 18-year-old King chose to enter the ministry. Throughout his time in college, King studied under the mentorship of its president, Baptist minister Benjamin Mays, who he would later credit with being his spiritual mentor. King had concluded that the church offered the most assuring way to answer an inner urge to serve humanity. His inner urge had begun developing, and he made peace with the Baptist church, as he believed he would be a rational minister with sermons that were a respectful force for ideas, even social protest. King graduated from Morehouse with a Bachelor of Arts BA in Sociology in 1948, aged 19. Religious Education, Ministry, Marriage and Family. Crozer Theological Seminary. King enrolled in Crozer Theological Seminary in Upland, Pennsylvania. King's father fully supported his decision to continue his education and made arrangements for King to work with prominent Crozer alum, J. Pius Barber, a family friend who pastored at Calvary Baptist Church in nearby Chester, Pennsylvania. King became known as one of the Sons of Calvary, an honor he shared with William Augustus Jones Jr. and Samuel D. Proctor who both went on to become well-known preachers in the black church. While attending Crozer, King was joined by Walter McCall, a former classmate at Morehouse. At Crozer, King was elected president of the student body. The African-American students of Crozer, for the most part, conducted their social activity on Edwards Street. King became fond of the street because a classmate had an aunt who prepared collard greens for them, which they both relished. King once reproved another student for keeping beer in his room, saying they had shared responsibility as African Americans to bear the burdens of the Negro race. For a time, he was interested in Walter Rauschenbusch's social gospel. In his third year at Crozer, King became romantically involved with the white daughter of an immigrant German woman who worked as a dietitian in the cafeteria. King planned to marry her, but friends, as well as King's father, advised against it saying that an interracial marriage would provoke animosity from both blacks and whites, potentially damaging his chances of ever pastoring a church in the South. King tearfully told a friend that he could not endure his mother's pain over the marriage and broke the relationship off six months later. He continued to have lingering feelings toward the woman he left, one friend was quoted as saying, he never recovered. Other friends, including Harry Belafonte, said Betty had been the love of King's life. King graduated with a Bachelor of Divinity, B.DIV, degree in 1951. 
he applied to the University of Edinburgh to do his doctorate in the School of Divinity. An offer was made by Edinburgh, but he chose Boston instead. Boston University. In 1951, King began doctoral studies in systematic theology at Boston University. While pursuing doctoral studies, King worked as an assistant minister at Boston's historic 12th Baptist Church with William Hunter Hester. Hester was an old friend of King's father and was an important influence on King. In Boston, King befriended a small cadre of local ministers his age and sometimes guest pastored at their churches, including Michael Haynes, associate pastor at 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury, and younger brother of jazz drummer Roy Haynes. The young men often held bull sessions in their various apartments, discussing theology, sermon style, and social issues. King attended philosophy classes at Harvard University as an audit student in 1952 and 1953. At the age of 25 in 1954, King was called as pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. King received his Ph.D. degree on June 5, 1955, with a dissertation, initially supervised by Edgar S. Brightman and, upon the latter's death, by Lawton Harold de Wolfe, titled A Comparison of the Conceptions of God in the Thinking of Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wieman. An academic inquiry in October 1991 concluded that portions of his doctoral dissertation had been plagiarized and he had acted improperly. However, D. Espite its finding, the committee said that no thought should be given to the revocation of Dr. King's doctoral degree, an action that the panel said would serve no purpose. The committee found that the dissertation still makes an intelligent contribution to scholarship. A letter is now attached to the copy of King's dissertation held in the university library, noting that numerous passages were included without the appropriate quotations and citations of sources. Significant debate exists on how to interpret King's plagiarism. Marriage and Family While studying at Boston University, he asked a friend from Atlanta named Mary Powell, a New England Conservatory of Music student, if she knew any nice Southern girls. Powell asked fellow student Coretta Scott if she was interested in meeting a Southern friend studying divinity. Scott was not interested in dating preachers but eventually agreed to allow Martin to telephone her based on Powell's description and vouching. On their first phone call, King told Scott, I am like Napoleon at Waterloo before your charms, to which she replied, you haven't even met me. They went out for dates in his green Chevy. After the second date, King was sure Scott possessed the qualities he sought in a wife. She had been an activist at Antioch as an undergraduate student. King married Coretta Scott on June 18, 1953, on the lawn of her parents' house in her hometown of Heiberger, Alabama. They became the parents of four children, Yolanda King, 1955-2007, Martin Luther King III, born in 1957, Dexter Scott King, born in 1961, and Bernice King, born in 1963. During their marriage, King limited Coretta's role in the civil rights movement, expecting her to be a housewife and mother. In December 1959, after being based in Montgomery for five years, King announced his return to Atlanta at the request of the SCLC. In Atlanta, King served until his death as co-pastor with his father at the Ebenezer Baptist Church and helped expand the civil rights movement across the South. Montgomery Bus Boycott, 1955 The Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, where King was called to be a minister in 1954, was influential in the Montgomery, Alabama, African-American community. As the church's pastor, he became known for his oratorical preaching in Montgomery and the surrounding region. In March 1955, Claudette Colvin, a 15 year old black schoolgirl in Montgomery, refused to give up her bus seat to a white man in violation of Jim Crow laws, local laws in the southern United States that enforced racial segregation. King was on the committee from the Birmingham African American community that looked into the case, e.d. Nixon and Clifford Durr decided to wait for a better case to pursue because the incident involved a minor. Nine months later on December 1, 1955, a similar incident occurred when Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a city bus. The two incidents led to the Montgomery bus boycott, 
which was urged and planned by Nixon and led by King. King was in his twenties and had just taken up his clerical role. The other ministers asked him to take a leadership role simply because his relative newness to community leadership made it easier for him to speak out. King was hesitant about taking the role but decided to do so if no one else wanted it. The boycott lasted for 385 days, and the situation became so tense that King's house was bombed. King was arrested for traveling 30 miles per hour in a 25 miles per hour zone and jailed during this campaign, which overnight drew the attention of national media and greatly increased King's public stature. The controversy ended when the United States District Court issued a ruling in Browder v. Gale that prohibited racial segregation on all Montgomery public buses. Blacks resumed riding the buses again and were able to sit in the front with full legal authorization. King's role in the bus boycott transformed him into a national figure and the best-known spokesman of the civil rights movement, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In 1957, King, Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, Joseph Lowery, and other civil rights activists founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. The group was created to harness the moral authority and organizing power of black churches to conduct nonviolent protests in the service of civil rights reform. The group was inspired by the crusades of evangelist Billy Graham, who befriended King, as well as the national organizing of the group in friendship, founded by King allies Stanley Levison and Ella Baker. King led the SCLC until his death. The SCLC's 1957 prayer pilgrimage for freedom was the first time King addressed a national audience. Other civil rights leaders involved in the SCLC with King included James Bevel, Alan Johnson, Curtis W. Harris, Walter E. Fontroy, C. T. Vivian, Andrew Young, the Freedom Singers, Cleveland Robinson, Randolph Blackwell, Annie Bell Robinson Devine, Charles Kenzie Steele, Alfred Daniel Williams King, Benjamin Hooks, Aaron Henry and Bayad Rustin. The Gandhi Society Harry Wachtel joined King's legal advisor Clarence B. Jones in defending four ministers of the SCLC in the libel case New York Times Company v. Sullivan. The case was litigated about the newspaper advertisement Heed Their Rising Voices. Wachtel founded a tax-exempt fund to cover the suit's expenses and assist the nonviolent civil rights movement through a more effective means of fundraising. This organization was named the Gandhi Society for Human Rights. King served as honorary president for the group. He was displeased with the pace that President Kennedy was using to address the issue of segregation. In 1962, King and the Gandhi Society produced a document that called on the president to follow in the footsteps of Abraham Lincoln and issue an executive order to deliver a blow for civil rights as a kind of second emancipation proclamation. Kennedy did not execute the order. The FBI was under written directive from Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy when it began tapping King's telephone line in the fall of 1963. Kennedy was concerned that public allegations of communists in the SCLC would derail the administration's civil rights initiatives. He warned King to discontinue these associations and later felt compelled to issue the written directive that authorized the FBI to wiretap King and other SCLC leaders. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover feared the civil rights movement and investigated the allegations of communist infiltration. When no evidence emerged to support this, the FBI used the incidental details caught on tape over the next five years, as part of its COINTELPRO program, in attempts to force King out of his leadership position. King believed that organized, nonviolent protest against the system of Southern segregation known as Jim Crow laws would lead to extensive media coverage of the struggle for black equality and voting rights. Journalistic accounts and televised footage of the daily deprivation and indignities suffered by Southern blacks, and of segregationist violence and harassment of civil rights workers and marchers, produced a wave of sympathetic public opinion that convinced the majority of Americans that the civil rights movement was the most important issue in American politics in the early 1960s. King organized and led marches for blacks' right to vote, desegregation, labor rights, and other basic civil rights. 
Most of these rights were successfully enacted into the law of the United States with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The SCLC put into practice the tactics of nonviolent protest with great success by strategically choosing the methods and places in which protests were carried out. There were often dramatic standoffs with segregationist authorities, who sometimes turned violent. Survived Knife Attack, 1958 On September 20, 1958, King was signing copies of his book Stride Toward Freedom in Bloomstein's department store in Harlem when he narrowly escaped death. Isola Curry, a mentally ill black woman who thought that King was conspiring against her with communists, stabbed him in the chest with a letter opener, which nearly impinged on the aorta. King received first aid by police officers Al Howard and Philip Romano. King underwent emergency surgery with three doctors, Aubrey de Lambert Maynard, Emile Naclario, and John W. V. Cordes. He remained hospitalized for several weeks. Curry was later found mentally incompetent to stand trial, Atlanta sit-ins, prison sentence, and the 1960 elections. Georgia Governor Ernest Vandiver expressed open hostility towards King's return to his hometown in late 1959. He claimed that wherever M. L. King Jr. has been there has followed in his wake a wave of crimes, and vowed to keep King under surveillance. On May 4, 1960, several months after his return, King drove writer Lillian Smith to Emory University when police stopped them. King was cited for driving without a license because he had not yet been issued a Georgia license. King's Alabama license was still valid, and Georgia law did not mandate any time limit for issuing a local license. King paid a fine but was unaware that his lawyer agreed to a plea deal that also included a probationary sentence. Meanwhile, the Atlanta student movement had been acting to desegregate businesses and public spaces in the city, organizing the Atlanta sit-ins from March 1960 onwards. In August the movement asked King to participate in a mass October sit-in, time to highlight how 1960's presidential election campaign had ignored civil rights. The coordinated day of action took place on October 19. King participated in a sit-in at the restaurant Inside Riches, Atlanta's largest department store, and was among the many arrested that day. The authorities released everyone over the next few days, except for King. Invoking his probationary plea deal, Judge J. Oscar Mitchell sentenced King on October 25 to four months of hard labor. Before dawn the next day, King was taken from his county jail cell and transported to Georgia State Prison. The arrest and harsh sentence drew nationwide attention. Many feared for King's safety, as he started a prison sentence with people convicted of violent crimes, many of them white and hostile to his activism. Both presidential candidates were asked to weigh in, at a time when both parties were courting the support of Southern whites and their political leadership, including Governor Vandiver. Nixon, with whom King had a closer relationship before, declined to make a statement despite a personal visit from Jackie Robinson requesting his intervention. Nixon's opponent John F. Kennedy called the governor, a Democrat, directly, enlisted his brother Robert to exert more pressure on state authorities, and also, at the personal request of Sergeant Shriver, made a phone call to King's wife to express his sympathy and offer his help. The pressure from Kennedy and others proved effective, and King was released two days later. King's father decided to openly endorse Kennedy's candidacy for the November 8 election which he narrowly won. After the October 19 sit-ins and following unrest, a 30-day truce was declared in Atlanta for desegregation negotiations. However, the negotiations failed and sit-ins and boycotts resumed in full swing for several months. On March 7, 1961, a group of black elders including King notified student leaders that a deal had been reached, the city's lunch counters would desegregate in fall 1961 in conjunction with the court-mandated desegregation of schools. Many students were disappointed at the compromise. In a large meeting on March 10 at Warren Memorial Methodist Church, the audience was hostile and frustrated towards the elders and the compromise. King then gave an impassioned speech calling participants to resist the cancerous disease of disunity and helping to calm tensions. 
Albany Movement, 1961. Main Article, Albany Movement. The Albany Movement was a desegregation coalition formed in Albany, Georgia, in November 1961. In December, King and the SCLC became involved. The movement mobilized thousands of citizens for a broad-front nonviolent attack on every aspect of segregation within the city and attracted nationwide attention. When King first visited on December 15, 1961, he had planned to stay a day or so and return home after giving counsel. The following day he was swept up in a mass arrest of peaceful demonstrators, and he declined bail until the city made concessions. According to King, that agreement was dishonored and violated by the city after he left town. King returned in July 1962 and was given the option of 45 days in jail or a $178 fine, equivalent to $1,600 in 2021, he chose jail. Three days into his sentence, police chief Lori Pritchett discreetly arranged for King's fine to be paid and ordered his release. We had witnessed persons being kicked off lunch counter stools, ejected from churches, and thrown into jail. But for the first time, we witnessed being kicked out of jail. It was later acknowledged by the King Center that Billy Graham was the one who bailed King out of jail during this time. After nearly a year of intense activism with few tangible results, the movement began to deteriorate. King requested a halt to all demonstrations and a day of penance to promote nonviolence and maintain the moral high ground. Divisions within the black community and the canny, low-key response by local government defeated efforts. Though the Albany effort proved a key lesson in tactics for King and the national civil rights movement, the national media was highly critical of King's role in the defeat and the SCLC's lack of results contributed to a growing gulf between the organization and the more radical SNCC. After Albany, King sought to choose engagements for the SCLC in which he could control the circumstances, rather than entering into pre-existing situations. Birmingham Campaign, 1963 In April 1963, the SCLC began a campaign against racial segregation and economic injustice in Birmingham, Alabama. The campaign used nonviolent but intentionally confrontational tactics, developed in part by Wyatt T. Walker. Black people in Birmingham, organizing with the SCLC, occupied public spaces with marches and sit-ins, openly violating laws that they considered unjust. King's intent was to provoke mass arrests and create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. The campaign's early volunteers did not succeed in shutting down the city or in drawing media attention to the police's actions. Over the concerns of an uncertain king, SCLC strategist James Bevel changed the course of the campaign by recruiting children and young adults to join in the demonstrations. Newsweek called this strategy a children's crusade. During the protests, the Birmingham Police Department, led by Eugene Bull Connor, used high-pressure water jets and police dogs against protesters, including children. Footage of the police response was broadcast on national television news and dominated the nation's attention, shocking many white Americans and consolidating black Americans behind the movement. Not all of the demonstrators were peaceful, despite the avowed intentions of the SCLC. In some cases, bystanders attacked the police, who responded with force. King and the SCLC were criticized for putting children in harm's way. But the campaign was a success, Connor lost his job, the Jim Crow signs came down, and public places became more open to blacks. King's reputation improved immensely. King was arrested and jailed early in the campaign, his 13th arrest out of 29. From his cell, he composed the now-famous letter from Birmingham Jail which responds to calls on the movement to pursue legal channels for social change. The letter has been described as one of the most important historical documents penned by a modern political prisoner. King argues that the crisis of racism is too urgent and the current system too entrenched, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor, it must be demanded by the oppressed. He points out that the Boston Tea Party, a celebrated act of rebellion in the American colonies, was illegal civil disobedience, and that, conversely, everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal. 
Walter Ruther, president of the United Auto Workers, arranged for $160,000 to bail out King and his fellow protesters. March on Washington, 1963. King, representing the SCLC, was among the leaders of the big six civil rights organizations who were instrumental in the organization of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which took place on August 28, 1963. The other leaders and organizations comprising the Big Six were Roy Wilkins from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Whitney Young, National Urban League, A. a Philip Randolph, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, John Lewis, SNCC, and James L. Farmer Jr. of the Congress of Racial Equality. Bayard Rustin's open homosexuality, support of socialism, and his former ties to the Communist Party USA caused many white and African-American leaders to demand King distance himself from Rustin, which King agreed to do. However, he did collaborate in the 1963 March on Washington, for which Rustin was the primary logistical and strategic organizer. For King, this role was another which courted controversy since he was one of the key figures who acceded to the wishes of United States President John F. Kennedy in changing the focus of the march. Kennedy initially opposed the march outright because he was concerned it would negatively impact the drive for passage of civil rights legislation. However, the organizers were firm that the march would proceed, with the march going forward, the Kennedys decided it was important to work to ensure its success. President Kennedy was concerned the turnout would be less than 100,000. Therefore, he enlisted the aid of additional church leaders and Walter Ruther, president of the United Automobile Workers, to help mobilize demonstrators for the cause. The March, a 1964 documentary film produced by the United States Information Agency. King's speech has been redacted from this video because of the copyright held by King's estate. The march originally was conceived as an event to dramatize the desperate condition of blacks in the southern U.S. and an opportunity to place organizers' concerns and grievances squarely before the seat of power in the nation's capital. Organizers intended to denounce the federal government for its failure to safeguard the civil rights and physical safety of civil rights workers and blacks. The group acquiesced to presidential pressure and influence, and the event ultimately took on a far less strident tone. As a result, some civil rights activists felt it presented an inaccurate, sanitized pageant of racial harmony, Malcolm X called it the farce on Washington, and the Nation of Islam forbade its members from attending the march. King gave his most famous speech, I Have a Dream, before the Lincoln Memorial during the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. I Have a Dream, 030 30-second sample from I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King Jr. at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom on August 28, 1963. Problems playing this file? See Media Help. The march made specific demands, an end to racial segregation in public schools, meaningful civil rights legislation, including a law prohibiting racial discrimination in employment, protection of civil rights workers from police brutality, a $2 minimum wage for all workers, equivalent to $18 in 2021, and self-government for Washington, D.C., then governed by Congressional Committee. Despite tensions, the march was a resounding success. More than a quarter of a million people of diverse ethnicities attended the event, sprawling from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial onto the National Mall and around the reflecting pool. At the time, it was the largest gathering of protesters in Washington, D.C.'s history. My name is Aria. Please like, share, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can be the first to be notified whenever we post you won't regret it.